Namaskar. Congratulations, Anna. I'm here to talk about uh, distilling distinction. Uh, and, uh, and this talk was uh, inspired by something that I, was, uh, I read in the 50s. Um, it was sort of the equivalent of the onion back then. Uh, and it was, the article went something like, you know, if the president wants to know what to do about nuclear power, uh, he doesn't know anything about nuclear power, what's he going to do? He's going to appoint a blue ribbon commission. And who's he going to put on this Blue Ribbon Commission? Well, you know, people who've studied nuclear power, people who have careers in nuclear power, people who've worked in nuclear power all their lives, people who are passionate about nuclear power. And he's going to get as many of these people as he can. He's going to put them on this commission, and then he's going to say, what should we do about nuclear power? And they're going to say, oh, it's a great idea. We should do more of it, of course. <laughs> um, you know, so if the president wants to know, what should we do about chemistry, who's he going to ask? He's going to ask Robert Lefkowitz. <laughs> Robert J. Lefkowitz. <laughs> I'm Robert M. Lefkowitz, so I actually don't have a Nobel in chemistry. Um, and, and, you know, what if the president wants to know, and this is purely hypothetical, what the heck is an API? Who's, who's he going to ask? Well, I mean, he's going to ask somebody who has the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in, in software, right? Richard Stallman has the Grace Murray Hopper Award from the ACM. You know, Linux Torvalds has the Internet Hall of Fame Award from the IEEE, right? There are all these very notable, very distinguished people that he might ask. Um, so this, this was all kind of hypothetical, uh, but it intersected with me about seven years ago. I was invited to go down to Washington, D.C. to lobby Congress on behalf of open source. So I wasn't sure why they chose me, but so they flew us all down to Washington, and we sat in a room in the Capitol for the whole day, and, and senators and congressmen would come in. We'd spend half an hour with each one of them, and I sat next to Bruce Mamjian. That's when I met Bruce. And this, this was early days for me in the open source community, and I was just, I was awestruck. He was one of my personal heroes. So he'd been with a Postgres project since the beginning, and, and, and what does it say about me that I was more excited that I met Bruce Mamjian than, than Joe Biden and Rick Santorum? <laughs> anyway, but it got me thinking, okay, so, you know, the president, you know, who's he going to ask? But, you know, congressmen and mayors and, you know, town councilmen, journalists, you know, they want to ask people, who are they going to ask for this stuff? Um, they're not going to ask the Nobel Prize winners, so they're, they're going to ask sort of the next level down. So those of you who have won the Nobel Prize or the Turing Award, this talk is not for you. <laughs> but, you know, for, because, you know, if you, if you just exude that much awesome sauce, people will call you up and give you an award. Further down, you kind of have to work at it a little bit more. So I wanted to understand, why is distinction important, and how do you get it? <clears throat> People have been thinking about this for a long time. The first person to codify it, really, why this is an important thing, was Aristotle on rhetoric. So I sort of categorized different kinds of ways of being persuasive. And we're computer scientists or programmers, software engineers, and we tend to favor a modality that he called di the dialectic, right, logos, arguing logically, making a logical argument which Aristotle pointed out is the least effective way of making your point. <laughs> the most effective way of making your point is rhetoric, which, and specifically the appeal to authority. What did he mean by the appeal to authority? It's like, well, if you use logic to try to convince somebody of something, they kind of have to understand what you're talking about. But if they don't understand what you're talking about, you either have to teach them everything you're talking about, or you can just say, look, I know way more about this than you do, so therefore, you should respect my opinion. And that doesn't work. <laughs> because they don't necessarily believe you. So what you need to do is you need to manufacture distinction. Distinction sort of, when I, when I went to do this talk, I was thinking, you know, distinguished. And it's like, the, what's the noun for distinguished? It's, you know, distinguishment. But, you know, I looked it up, and it's, in fact, it's distinction, which doesn't seem right, but, but it is, I think. Anyway, 
So you have to manufacture distinction. So, so he spends a lot of time talking about how do you manufacture distinction? How do you get people to believe that you know what you're talking about so you don't have to actually convince them logically? So just saying, you know, I know more about this than you do and I'm smarter than you do doesn't work. So then the next thing that you could do is you could try to do stuff that they would say, oh, look, they did that stuff. Therefore, they must know what they're doing. They're distinguished by virtue of having done stuff. And that's kind of a way of doing it. And that's what I would call, I guess, distilling distinction. You, you know, you work at it. <clears throat> and that's, that's the advice Laura was, uh, was giving to the people, you know, code 2040, right? Because this is not just for, this is for convincing people in all kinds of settings, including like job interviews, right? You can go to a job interview and say, and say, I'm really smart and I learn fast. Or, you know, you could set up a GitHub account, you can have projects, you know, you side projects, and then people look at it and say, oh, yeah, they're distinguished from the other candidates. They're distinctive in some way. <clears throat> but the easiest and fastest and most efficient way to get distinction, distinction is to borrow it from somebody else. So, if you have the Nobel Committee, and the Nobel Committee has this vast reservoir of distinction that they have, that they have distilled over the ages, and they will sort of hand out buckets or little cups to people, sort of doling it out. Uh, and, 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 and you do this with universities too, right? You want to you say, you know, I graduated from MIT, because that sounds better, and you know, it's, it's, you're, you're sort of borrowing a little bit of the distinction that MIT has distilled over the years, and make it, make it you know, kind of yours. Um, <clears throat> so where is the reservoir of distinction stored for software and computer science? Well, we have these professional organizations, the ACM and the IEEE. And I'm just going to talk ACM, but you know, anytime I say ACM, you could substitute IEEE if you want, or ACM and or IEEE, anything like that. So, so the ACM. Um, it's, it's this professional software organization, and, and they hand out these awards, like the Grace Murray Hopper Award and the Turing Award, and they have a distinguished member program. So for those people who are not so obviously awesome, and who have to work at it a little bit more. And you know, the process is, you, you get nominated, and then committees sort of, just like the Nobel Committee, but not as distinguished, sort of decide you know, which kinds of distinction are really worthy of recognition. No different than what the open source community does for the open source awards, say. So we like to say that we've won in open source. Um, but to, to quote, to requote Tim O'Reilly, to retweet Tim O'Reilly, who likes to say, um, you know, the future is not evenly distributed yet, in some places, we're still on that first they're ignoring us part. Right? And I might say that, that that holds true for some reason with the ACM and the IEEE. Because how many in the last five years members of the open source community whose names you might recognize have been recognized by the ACM as distinguished members? I think the answer is one. Guido Van Rossum, who is indeed distinguished and deserves the honor. And how might he have achieved this honor? Well, you know, the ACM is a little uh, academic in its leanings. They're not very close with the uh, open source community, and not a lot of us are members of the ACM. And so typically the way they might do it is they'd go to Google Scholar and see, you know, is this person distinguished in the sense of academic distinction as he published works. And in the case of Guido Van Rossum, the answer is yes. He published a paper, Amoeba, <clears throat> the Distributed Operating System, which has been cited over 500 times. That's very distinct, distinctive. It's worthy of distinction. Right? But you know, we know we don't want to give people something just because they got lucky one time, so perhaps he's done other work. Maybe, you know, he's written a book about Python, which has also been quoted, you know, not, cited not as much, but still reasonable. Clearly, this is a man worthy of distinction. So why aren't we members? 
why aren't we nominating ourselves for this distinction and sort of participating, drinking from the cistern of distinction that the ACM has uh, stored? Well, because they don't do anything for us, right? We, we ignore them, really. Plus, they don't get it, right? I mean, pff, amoeba. <laughs> right? So let's ignore them. No, let's ridicule them. Plus, I don't like the way they stood on SOPA. Right? There are public position statements on these things I completely disagree with. We should, we should boycott them, actually. Let's fight them. And then the, how does that story end? But what I want to focus on is not that, because yeah, I love words, um, and the, the, word, the whole word cluster around distinguished I really love, but, but the word in, in this quote that I want to focus on is them. <clears throat> Open source is a, is a solipsis, uh, uh, as a rhetorician would say. It's a, because it's actually open source software, and we leave out the word software because everybody knows that it's software, so we don't actually have to say it in that rhetorical device. That figure of speech is called solipsis. So, but it's open source software, so we're an open source community, but we're also part of the software community because it's open source software. And the ACM is this professional organization for software, IEEE. So what is the word in the English language for the group of them that includes us? <laughs> that, the word is us. <laughs> We're in a group with us in it. It's not them, it's us. <clears throat> so this is our organization, or it could be our organization, but you know, we don't join because we, we disagree with it. <clears throat> So the analogy that I drew, I'm going to try to make a logical argument here, and, and I know it's not going to be effective, but I, I majored in computer science, so I, I try to use logic every once in a while. It's a bad habit. I'm an amateur orator, but I'm a software professional. Right? It's, so it's kind of like voting, right? In a national election or sta statewide election or municipal elections even, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people vote. Your vote counts for nothing. I mean, logically, really. I mean, if you work out the math, right, it's 0, 0.00 something impact. Um, plus, like if somebody is, and I don't want to pick on any particular thing, but you know, whether you, whether you dislike Bush or Obama, if like somebody is in office and you disagree with them, what's the logical thing to do? Logical thing to do is boycott it and not vote in the next election. Or maybe the logical thing to do is to participate and vote extra hard in the next election because you want to change it to be more like what you want in there. And if, if it's us, right, if we're the us, if we're the citizenry, if we're the professionals, then, then we should be getting involved. So why do we vote even though it makes no logical sense? It's because we're actually using the appeal to authority, the ethical appeal. We're trying to be rhetorical. We're trying to say, I'm voting because I want to send a signal, I want to make a statement, I want to say, I care what happens here. Even if what I'm doing is purely symbolic because it has no effect whatsoever, I'm still going to do it just to let everybody else know what a good citizen I am. Because I'm distilling some distinction as a, as a, as a, as a citizen, as a, as a responsible citizen. And we could do the very same thing for the ACM or the IEEE. Oh, let's go back for a second. Because <clears throat> the other thing that we could do is we could start our own organization of software professionals. We'll, you know, we'll build our own, and we'll distill our own reservoir of distinction, and we'll compete with them. But it's, just, it's actually easier. It's like, that's like starting a third party. Right? It's just actually easier to work within the parties that are there and, and make it change course to be more like what we want, because it's us, not them. So what do you have to do to become a distinguished member of the ACM? Right? You have to demonstrate substantial depth and breadth. You have to serve as a mentor or role model in some technical wise for your colleagues. You have to uh, contribute to the field beyond the norm, including conference presentations. That seems like a bar that many people in this room could get over. Right? And, and the, the ACM program, in fact, they have a distinguished 
educator track and a distinguished scientist track and a distinguished engineer track for you know, people who are distinguished in different wises. And most of us in this room would probably want to think of ourselves as engineers rather than scientists or educators, although you, know, you could do the other side. But just thinking about it from an engineering point of view, what do, you, what do you need to do to be a distinguished engineer? You have to lead the implementation of some new technology or architecture. A couple of people in this room maybe have done that. Right? Responsible for significant technology transfer. Yeah, maybe you've done that. <clears throat> or evidence of having developed some intellectual property. Uh, I may, may not like the word patents in there, but hey, if it was us, if there were more of us, you know, we could change that wording. Just have you know, evidence of having developed. But this seems like something that we could totally do. It, this is totally us. <clears throat> So, uh, sorry if I got a little impassioned there, but <clears throat> so many people here have done such great stuff, worthy of such distinction, that it bothers me that we keep it to ourselves, and we don't participate in the wider world, and we don't give ourselves the opportunity to recognize all the great work that we're doing. So. You can't play if you don't join, right? You have to be a member to be nominated. You have to be a member to nominate. And it takes a while. This is not something that happens overnight because you can't join and, and, and be immediately. But, but some of you are members. I, I know that there's a, at least one fellow of the ACM and fellow of the IEEE, both in the same person. Like, he's a, he's a double fellow in the room today. Um, you know, we know Guido's a, a, a distinguished engineer. We know that there's people who are sort of on the inside who can vouch for us and move us through the process. So, so this is the call to action. You know, let's, let's participate. Let's join professional organizations. Let's n nominate each other and recognize each other for the great work that we're doing. Right? I'm familiar with the process. If, need somebody to give you some tips, I'm Rommel at acm.org. Twitter handle is Rommel. Type R0ML into pretty much any piece of software, it points you at me. And uh, thank you for allowing me to speak to such a distinguished audience. <laughs>